we need to have a chat about Copilot. I've pushed back against people who say this product or group of products is confusing and inconsistent in how it's presented. But then I run into situations like this, where I have three different Copilots with very different capabilities, all open in one edge window and all looking for all intents and purposes the same. How can I argue that's not confusing? Copilot is an amazing brand idea, so succinctly summing up a new type of product. But between Copilot and Copilot for Microsoft 365, Security Copilot, SharePoint Copilot, and even Copilot Plus PCs. Is that Copilot Plus on a PC or is the PC called Copilot Plus? It's become confusing and takes nearly as long to explain which Copilot you are talking about as it does to describe any feature. So in this video, I want to dig into the issue of how Copilot became so confusing, where some key inconsistencies lay, what Microsoft should do about it, and most importantly, what should you do to ensure confusion doesn't derail your adoption of this impactful and useful set of products. Before we start though, a quick introduction. My name is Nick DeCorsi. I'm the owner of Bright Ideas Agency, a digital transformation consulting company focused on the needs of smaller businesses. I'm also the author of Who's in the Copilot Seat, a guidebook for small and medium-sized business leaders on how to adopt AI technology. If you're interested in learning more about working with me or getting a copy of my book, there are links below where you can get more information. Now, first of all, I want to be clear. I use a bunch of Copilot products every single day. And foundationally, I believe this is a very useful set of products that virtually every information focused business user would get benefit from adopting. However, I also think that the way this product set has been developed creates a set of barriers to entry and potential for confusion that I think stem from a series of questionable decisions. As always, where you see screen recording in this video, it's created using demo accounts. Just like here, where you see Copilot with Graph Grounded Chat open on the left in Teams, and Copilot in Edge also accessing Graph Grounded Chat on the right. If I look for loop files on the left, I find none. If I look for them on the right, they appear. Why? Or here, where I check what is indexed as part of the semantic index and see it includes OneNote files. But if I want to find details of this Project Falcon page in OneNote, I can do so immediately with Microsoft Search, but try as I might, nothing appears in Copilot. Copilot appears blind to OneNote content anywhere other than directly in the OneNote app. Why? Or a final example, here in Outlook, I'm drafting a new email, and I have three different Copilot buttons available to me. One opens Copilot in Outlook, which is entirely grounded on Outlook. One offers me drafting help for my email. And the third opens Copilot with Graph Grounded Chat. Why? All these experiences are part of Copilot for Microsoft 365. I'm not even touching on the dozens of other Copilots yet. And yet there are big inconsistencies like these, both between how the same product works in different places and in how various parts of Copilot live up to the promise of Microsoft's documentation and product demos. This patchwork just isn't good for adoption. A small number of users will tenaciously try and try again to get the output they want. But the vast majority, when faced with technology confusion, or turn off and engage with it as little as possible. These problems aren't just annoying, but may actually be hurting the ROI some users are getting with this fairly expensive add-on license. The fact is that the Copilot that was so excitingly announced over a year ago didn't seem to be this patchwork of separate and inconsistent capabilities. Expectations like a broad ability to ground requests across Copilot in a wide range of Microsoft 365 data, or to be able to seamlessly interact from chat into app-based creation experiences, weren't wild ideas those of us excited by Copilot came up with. They were literally laid out on screen by the user experiences Microsoft's own team showed off when the product got announced. If we want a product that takes the heavy lifting of how to do something off the user so they can just focus on the what, 
these issues are important. If our users spend their time worrying about how Copilot works rather than worrying about how PowerPoint works, we've just taken an existing problem and applied it to a new product. Copilot needs to be an omnipresent helper that just works. But so far, we've only considered inconsistencies and confusion that appear inside Copilot for Microsoft 365. The breadth of the Copilot brand and the potential for it to just be overwhelming goes far further. But before we look at that, if you're finding this video useful, it would be great if you'd give it a like. And if you want to see more like this, please subscribe to the channel. And it's also really helpful to get this video in front of a bigger audience if you could comment on it too. It doesn't need to be anything long, maybe just a thumbs up emoji so I know you were here, but it really is a big help. In my book, Who's in the Copilot Seat? I focus in on the difference between Copilot with a capital C, the branding Microsoft has applied to its AI product stack, and Copilot with a lowercase c, a useful way to think of the role of generative AI assistants as human supervised, task based, and present throughout your work journey. After all, a co-pilot without a pilot isn't that useful. However, while most of Microsoft's AI assistive tools are indeed co-pilots, the fact that they have decided that for branding purposes, they also need to be co-pilots is becoming increasingly confusing. Bing Chat became Microsoft Copilot, but so did the business chat and then Microsoft 365 chat we were promised that ended up as Microsoft Copilot with Graph Grounded chat. But then you look at the Copilot in Teams or Outlook or Windows or even the Copilot in Edge, and they look like the same thing. But as I just showed you in reference to loop files at least, they are subtly different. And then all the features in the apps are Copilots too, whether it be a chat experience just like those other Copilots, or a button for a specific feature, or even just something you do with a right click. And then there are situations where we just get add-on Copilots when you buy Copilot for Microsoft 365, like the new Copilot in Forms. But just when you think you understand, another part of Microsoft 365 gets a Copilot, Copilot in Planner, but for this you need to buy an extra license. But not for Copilots in Power Apps or Power Automate, they are just thrown in for free in services where we're completely used to paying for upgraded features. The fact is that between everything being branded Copilot and there being inconsistent capabilities in Copilots that appear on the surface to be very similarly featured, fully understanding Copilot is a lot more complex than it really needs to be. And I hear from users regularly who are frustrated that it just isn't simpler. So why have we ended up with this Copilot confusion? The only people who know the answer to this work at Microsoft, and I doubt they'll tell us or even fully take ownership of the confusion I'm highlighting. But my guess is that much of the problem comes down to Copilot not being developed as a single product, but left to the owners of individual apps to integrate. This, in my opinion, rings very similar to the problems I've highlighted here before of Loop being inconsistently implemented across Microsoft 365. And while it seems more focus has been given to Copilot, this hasn't exactly assured broad-based consistency across the features we're seeing in different places. I'm also going to guess that some of the confusion comes down to Microsoft changing course on Teams sometime into the development of Copilot. With Teams still being the only place where most Copilot extensibility options exist, and a big piece of Copilot extensibility being the Teams existing app model, it seems clear that a core initial intent was for Teams and Copilot to be very powerfully linked and integrated. But then came the European Union's opinions on Teams, stemming from a Slack-derived antitrust claim protesting the bundling of Teams with Microsoft 365. This resulted in Teams being unbundled from Microsoft 365 and a sudden need to uncouple the success of Copilot for Microsoft 365 from Teams. But the last part of the puzzle I find most confusing is why the experience of grounding across Microsoft 365 is so inconsistent throughout Copilot. There are assets we can access with the Graph API or with Microsoft Search that are completely invisible to Copilot in some places, like OneNote files. And we're seeing different options in different places, it's difficult to really understand if there's some purposeful intent to this, or whether in some places they just forgot to turn on options they put somewhere else. The example of Loop being available in some co-pilots and not others just leaves me scratching my head. 
But there are other places like Copilot Informs where grabbing existing data as part of the creation process would just make sense. Or even Copilot in Planner where you can now access other Microsoft 365 data but not purposefully file by file and not as part of the plan creation process. Microsoft's own Copilot process documentation indicates that the inclusion of grounding content is something that happens at the orchestration level underneath requests stemming from the individual apps. And it is then on the orchestrator to return the response or instruction to the app that aligns to its capabilities. This being the case and imagining there are already robust internal APIs that Microsoft is using to drive these experiences, the inconsistencies in grounding support are just perplexing. Do you have any idea why this might have ended up the way it has? If you do, let me know down in the comments. So that really leaves us with two questions. What should Microsoft do about this? And what can we do as businesses adopting these tools until they do? It's my view that Copilot is one of the best branded decisions Microsoft has made in recent memory. But you can definitely get too much of a good thing. And at this point, the fact that everything is Copilot is starting to make it meaningless. And with each additional layer of Copilot, it doesn't become a better or richer brand. It just becomes something that's more confusing to message to users. Even basic things like being able to search for information on a product is practically impossible when everything is called the same name. Instead of just vacuuming up every possible AI feature that's added across Microsoft 365 and associated product stacks and calling it Copilot, I think that a more discerning understanding of what Copilot is versus just an AI feature is needed. And personally, I think it should come down to three things. Copilot should be a chat initiated experience. It should be contextually aware and it should be grounded on the graph and connected data. That grounding experience should also be universally consistent and make every type of data source listed as available in the Copilot Semantic Index an option for data input. This would mean that certain AI features currently branded as Copilot would just become features. And that's okay. We have had upgraded licenses that turn on different features for a while. So a Copilot for Microsoft 365 license being a superset of Copilots and related AI features would actually make a lot of sense. Is this a direction Microsoft might take? Who knows? But I think the likelihood is that they will do something as I'm sure they're also hearing that confusion has set in. On the grounding front at least, we can see that almost constant improvements are being made across Microsoft 365. But if this isn't going to be immediately fixed by Microsoft, what should you do as a business owner or an adoption lead for Copilot for Microsoft 365? In Microsoft's 2024 Work Trend Index report, they identify the rise of the Copilot power user, those who save an average of more than 30 minutes each day by using Copilot. There were many attributes that correlated with these power users, but I'm going to highlight three important ones. First, they were more likely to be in organizations where training on Copilot has been prioritized. And this makes a lot of sense, as with anything that is hard or confusing to get started with, getting expert support is an important enabler. I certainly focus in on not just the capabilities of Copilot in apps, but also the differences between them when I do training with end users. Second, they see their leaders lean in on AI acting as examples for how AI can benefit the business. This is incredibly important and leaders must be equipped with knowledge, not just on how tools like Copilot work, but also general safety and responsibility issues around generative AI, as well as understanding how adopting a tool like Copilot looks a bit different to something like a new accounting system. Last, and the number one predictor of whether someone is a power user, is whether they frequently experiment with using AI to enhance their work. And this comes down to having an adoption program that offers that room for and safety in experimenting, understanding that the dividends of the time spent on that experimentation will accrue over time. Despite the potential for Copilot as a product being confusing, those who are well supported through a properly structured adoption and training program see great success. Microsoft has some fantastic resources to support a well-managed Copilot for Microsoft 365 adoption program. This includes guidance for adoption leaders, as well as for end users. 
However, if you're rolling out this product in a small or medium sized business and you need help, consider checking out my Copilot for Microsoft 365 adoption package that provides all the consulting and training services most smaller businesses need to support their Copilot rollout presented with one understandable fixed price. A link to find out more and to access other options like my free AI course for business leaders is down below. It would be true to say that I'm frustrated by some of what I see as missteps in how Copilot is described and executed as a set of products at present. And I know some of you are too. But this comes from a place of believing this is a transformational product that truly has a place in the toolkit of nearly every type of information worker, not only to make them more productive, but also to ensure they have better emotional and mental health balance with the demands of their role. Average users don't like feeling as if they are beta testers of incomplete software, and a product where the guidance is to just go and experiment is going to lead all types of users into gotchas a lot more readily than other types of systems where we just teach users to press the buttons they need to get the job done. It's great when users are pushing the boundaries of a tool like Copilot, but also disappointing when their takeaway from that process is confusion rather than being wowed with a little taste of the future. Copilot is a powerful set of tools. As I said, I use Copilot every day, but I also use other services like ChatGPT too. Copilot has many benefits for certain workloads, but far simpler products like ChatGPT or Claude have similar levels of base AI power while also being far more straightforward to keep track of changes with. As I said in my last video, average users don't want a side hustle in keeping track of Copilot's changes, so trying to keep this as simple as possible is in everyone's best interests, Microsoft's, those leading adoption programs, and the end users gaining benefit from these products. What do you think about this issue? Do you find Copilot confusing? How do you keep track of the differences between the products and the various updates? Let me know down in the comments. Thanks for watching through to the end. Until the next video, bye bye.